This is episode 11 of Magic and the Law of Attraction with your host, Madam Pamita. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Madam Pamita, and you're listening once again to Magic and the Law of Attraction, the podcast where you'll learn how to transform your life in magical ways to make it the very best that it can be. Well, it's been quite a whirlwind of a week at the Parlor of Wonders, right at the solar eclipse that we had earlier this month. My 95-year-old father went into the hospital and now we've brought him home for hospice care. It's an amazing, profound, mostly happy, sometimes sad, but nonetheless beautiful thing to be able to be with someone at the end of his lifetime and help him transition to his next great adventure. Needless to say, I have been taking more time to be with him and less time for newsletters and readings and blogging and all of that. But I want to let you know that this podcast is not going to be neglected. I get such pleasure out of planning and recording these for you. And your reviews and feedback are all so amazingly lovely. We are making a very special gathering of powerful and intentional magicians here. I kind of picture all of you being like the guy on the magician card in the tarot, masterfully manifesting the lives that you want to create and using focused magic to do it. Magic helps us realize that limits are illusions. The magic that you are doing tears down that illusion and tells the truth that you are powerful, that you are a creator, and that you can have or do or be anything. So for today's episode, since you are those master magicians ready for upper level work, I'm going to invite you into my secret alchemist lab of mystery and magic. What's that fabulous fragrance I hear you say? Well, that my friend is incense. Yes, today we are going to be diving in to learn all about intoxicating incense the gorgeous history of incense and the power of scent for making magic. We're going to learn about the myriad forms that incense can take, why you would want to choose one form over another, and the mysterious and mystical ways to use incense magically. I tell you, you're going to love all the ideas that you get in this episode. If you haven't been using incense magically, I know it will get you started on using this amazing magical tool. And if you have been using incense in your magical work, I know it will inspire you to start using it in new and creative ways that you may not have thought of. So John Paul from Arvada, Colorado writes, I have a question about incense and how it magically plays an important role in spell work. There's so many types of incense from loose, herbal, self-lighting, cones, sticks. Is one type better over another in doing spell work? Also, will diffusing essential oils work the same way as incense, especially when spellwork calls for waving a tool or items through the smoke? And do you have any tips on making incense? John Paul is diving right in with a ton of great questions, and I love that. I feel like incense is one magical tool that kind of gets the short shrift. We tend to focus on doing magic with candles, gemstones, and oils, and incense seems to get put on well, to get put on the back burner. It's relegated to being a bit player in the spell when it could be the star of the show. And I think that part of the reason for this is that incense comes in a lot of different forms and some of them can be confusing. I grew up in the 60s and 70s and had an older sister who was sort of a hippie. So I grew up with incense sticks and cones all around me. But I have clients who have never lit incense before and can be a little confused by what to do with it. Even for me, I remember buying my first magical incense when I was in my 20s, and it was loose incense. I knew how to light an incense cone, but what the heck was I supposed to do with this weird but amazing smelling powder? So John Paul, this is a great topic to dive into. It's one that I'm sure many people are curious about, And I'm super glad you asked these questions. Thank you so much. So let's start out by talking about what incense is. 
Incense is any material that releases a fragrance when it is burned. If you've ever used incense, you've seen the wispy curls of gray smoke rising up toward the sky and smelled its enticing fragrance. The way we perceive incense is unique. Even if you've never smelled a certain incense fragrance before, if you walk into a room where incense has been burned, you can identify that some sort of incense has been used there. Incense connects to us at our deepest level at what I believe to be our collective historical memory. We can probably say that the origin of incense is as old as humans controlling fire. The first incenses were simply fragrant plant material added to fire. If you think about those earliest prehistoric people, it's certain that people all over the world discovered that if they threw certain aromatic woods into the campfire, that the smoke smelled different. And as people evolved in their spiritual beliefs that this magical, sweet-smelling smoke could be used for special ceremonies and rituals. The result was that over millennia, incense became sought after and valuable. If you are familiar with the stories of the Bible, where incidentally, incense is mentioned 170 times, you will know the story of the three magi, which, by the way, means three magicians. To honor the infant Jesus, the three magi are said to have brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Frankincense and myrrh are both resins used as incense, and in biblical times, they were as revered and valued as gold. So why was incense as precious as gold? because for centuries and millennia before biblical times, people had been recognizing the spiritual power of incense. And looking back throughout history, we see documentation and archeological evidence of Egyptians, Babylonians, the Indus cultures, ancient Greeks and Romans, ancient Chinese, Koreans, and Japanese, indigenous American cultures, and so on, all using incense for religious rites ceremonies, and divination. This is a universal truth that historically all the people in the world discovered the spiritual power of incense. As a result, with this great desire for aromatic plant matter to burn came a bustling trade. Incense alongside spices and silks became a lucrative trade commodity in Asia and Europe. It was part of what built the wealth of the Arabian cultures who formed and controlled the formidable trade route called the incense route. So why was it so special? What was the incense used for? If we look cross-culturally, we do see incense used, of course, just for pleasure, to make an environment smell beautiful. But as a result of this, it was also often used for funeral rites, mostly to cover up the smell of decay. Incense was also used medicinally. Before the understanding of germs, incense would be used to rid the environment of illness. It was also used to fumigate and get rid of pests. And this is still done to get rid of mosquitoes. However, by far the primary use of incense was to connect to the spirit world. For some cultures, this meant incense was used for clearing out negative spirits. For others, incense was a sacrifice to appease the gods with its pleasant aroma. For other cultures, it was a way to offer prayers that would drift skyward to the gods in the heavens. For others, it was a means of consulting the oracles. And for still others, it was a method of worship or way to create ceremonial ritual. But for all of them, it was a means to connect to divine energy. So when we do magic, whether that is a formal magical spell or simply wanting to set a powerful intention, it can absolutely be helpful to connect to divine energy. And incense helps us to focus those intentions in a ritualistic way. What I mean by that is that 
you have to do certain steps to burn the incense. And those steps themselves can take us out of our day-to-day consciousness and put us into ritual space, which empowers our intention. The ritual of lighting incense can bring us into the mindful present. But there are different forms of incense and some are definitely more involved than others. I'm going to touch on just some of the major forms that incense can take. So this list is by no means complete, but it will get you through about 99% of the incense you will encounter. So I'm going to begin by talking about direct burning incense or what's also known as combustible incense. This is incense that includes easily burnable material along with the scented material. So first we have stick incense or what is sometimes called joss sticks. If you live in the US, this is probably the most common incense that you will encounter. It's the kind you find at truck stops and head shops. Does anyone say head shop anymore? Is that still a thing? Who knows? Anyway, (laughs) stick incense is simply a long slim piece of a bamboo stick covered with combustible material, usually some kind of wood sawdust that's been dipped in a fragrance oil, or if it's a more high-end incense, the sawdust is blended with essential oils and herbs. And it's usually purchased in packets of a dozen or so. This is probably one of the simplest incenses to work with. You just light the tip, let it burn for several seconds, blow out the flame, and then you will have a little ember burning at the end that will give off a beautiful fragrant smoke as the combustible material burns down. You can hold the stick in your hand, of course, but a lot of people like to put it in an incense holder. This can be a tray of some kind that has a small hole that you place the stick into, but you can also make your own holder. I've made them with clean sand in a tin can, or if you don't have sand, you can use dried rice or beans in a jar or can, and then stick the blank end of the incense into this and it will stand up straight so that it can burn completely. Another form of incense that is sort of mainstream popular is cone incense. Now, I'll have to say that cone incense seems to have been a little more popular in the 60s and 70s and is a little harder to find now, but again, it's a very simple incense to work with. It looks like a small cone, like an upside down ice cream cone with the pointy end facing up. The way to light cone incense is very similar to stick incense. You light the tip of the cone and then you place the wide end down on a heat proof dish of some kind. You wait several seconds and then you blow out the flame and there will be an ember glowing at the tip that will give off the fragrant smoke as it burns down. In some ways, while stick incense might seem like the easiest incense, I have to say that cone incense gets the edge in the easy department because you don't need to figure out a holder for it. Any heat proof dish will work. Sometimes I can be a lazy magician and not wanna work too hard or overthink what I'm doing, but still want to do some ritual and magic. And when I'm in that mood, cone incense is my jam. Do people still say that's my jam? Okay, if that's old, then consider me bringing back that's my jam, okay? All right, moving right along. The next kind of incense I want to talk about is loose incense, which is sometimes called self-lighting incense. Now, while you will almost definitely find stick and cone incense that has no spiritual intent behind it, I mean, it may be just made with the intent of making your pad smell groovy. Okay, now I'm using old time words on purpose. Loose incense, on the other hand, is something you will probably only find in a magical context. You see a lot of loose incense in the hoodoo tradition, and in my experience, you'll also find a lot of loose incense coming from occult shops. Loose incense is made from some kind of combustible material, generally sawdust with a little color added, mixed with a little saltpeter to ignite the sawdust and get it burning, and herbs and essential oils and sometimes fragrance, all of it blended for a magical intent of some kind. One of the reasons you might find these at your local magic emporium is that they are fairly simple to make. And so as a result, you can find some amazing boutique blends of loose incense made in small batches with real herbs, resins, and essential oils in them. Loose incense is fairly simple on the front end of making it and to burn it, it's not too hard either. 
You just place a small pile of the incense on a heat-proof dish, pinch it together into a cone shape, and light the top of it, just like you would light an incense cone. A more traditional way to deal with loose incense is to take a small piece of paper to make a cone shape, and then pack the incense in there and mold a cone, and then pop that molded cone out onto your heat-proof dish. But personally, I find this a little fussy when you can just as easily form a cone by pinching it together with your fingers on the dish. Granted, a pinched together cone won't look smooth and beautiful like a molded cone, but I kind of like the rustic look with my magical work anyway. The thing you do want to be aware of is that the more firmly you pack the loose incense together, the longer your incense will stay lit. It's really not a big deal if it goes out, of course, you just relight it. And it's definitely not a negative sign if you have to relight any incense more than once. Again, as with cone incense, you light the point of the cone, let it burn for several seconds, and then very gently, you don't want to blow your incense powder everywhere. You blow it out so that just the ember is burning. Or you can be like me, pinch together a rudimentary cone and then light it at the tip and also in several other places on the side, and let the beautiful smoke weave its fragrant spell in your room. Before I get to the rest of the forms of incense, the indirect burning incenses, I want to veer off the path a bit here and talk about smokeless incense. People with asthma or those who don't want to breathe in smoke for whatever reason can create what I call smokeless incense. You get a small spray bottle and fill it with spring water, and then add several drops of a spiritual oil blend or essential oils. You can shake this bottle and then spray this formula, getting the same effect as incense without the smoke. John Paul asks about using a diffuser with essential oils as a replacement. And while essential oils in this way can definitely bring some magical energy into a space, I like the tool of the spray bottle just a little better. The mist that you make with the spray bottle mimics the visual element of incense in a way that just using a diffuser doesn't. The only caveat is if you use this method, you have to be careful not to spray this blend directly onto curtains, carpets, or furnitures where the oils in the spray might stain or damage them. Smokeless incense is a great incense substitute and can be used in practically all the ways regular incense can. Okay, aside from working with smokeless incense, the first three forms of incense that we talked about, sticks, cones, and self-lighting incense, are all manufactured and processed and have that source of combustion included with the incense. They are direct burning incense. But the next two I'm going to talk about take us back to the oldest times of spiritual work, to plain aromatic botanicals that need an outside source of flame to burn. The first one I'm going to talk about are smudge sticks. Smudge sticks are bundles of plant material packed together tightly or sticks of aromatic woods dried so that they can be lit and the smoke used ceremonially. Sometimes these are identified solely with Native American cultures, but actually the use of bundled herbs and aromatic wood sticks appears in many other cultures as well. And the word smudge simply means to fumigate with smoke. Some examples of smudge sticks can be bundles of sage, lavender, or mugwort, or sticks of aromatic wood like Palo Santo. The dried bundle or stick is lit at one end. And just as with cones and sticks, when the material seems to be burning well, the flame is blown out and the aromatic smoke can be directed for magical work. Now, because these are dried herbs and woods only, they will often burn for a bit and then the flame will die out and they will have to be relit. This is perfectly normal and to be expected. They don't have any additional source of combustion. So if you're working with these, keeping a lighter or a match or a candle flame handy to relight them is definitely a must. The last form of incense I'm going to cover in this episode is the indirect burning of botanicals on charcoal. This is really a mini version of those ancients tossing aromatic resins and herbs into the campfire. I like to call these resin incense or single herb incense or herbal incense blends. For this type of incense burning, you just light a flat charcoal disc or square. 
one that is specially designed for burning incense. And that means not a charcoal briquette for the barbecue. And once that charcoal has turned to a white ashy ember, you can place the herbs on it that you would like to burn. One of the things that I love about this type of incense is that it is totally customizable. If you are into herbal magic, you can choose the herbs whose energy you would like to invoke, creating a spell in the moment that is completely your own. You are not at the mercy of an incense maker. You get to choose. You are in charge. Now, that being said, some botanicals seem to lend themselves better to this kind of work. For example, resins such as copal or benzoin or our old friends frankincense and myrrh will give off beautifully and powerfully fragrant smoke. Some woody herbs such as cinnamon, cedar, and allspice will also smell quite nice when burned. Some leafy herbs will smell lovely too, while others will smell like, well, smell like burning fall leaves. I personally love that campfire smell, but some people don't, so your mileage may vary. There are some herbs and botanicals that don't lend themselves so readily to this kind of burning. A whole nutmeg, for example, is too hard, thick, and woody to burn on a charcoal, but ground nutmeg powder can burn well and easily, and whole juniper berries placed on a charcoal will pop, but ground up juniper will burn nicely. Whenever you would like to burn something, if it comes in a whole form, think about grinding it first before burning. And a word about the charcoal. Not all charcoal is created equal. The charcoal discs that you generally find in occult shops are self-lighting charcoal made with saltpeter. You'll recognize this if you light the charcoal and see small sizzling sparks move across the charcoal. This can be very handy for lighting charcoal, but some people would rather avoid breathing in this chemical mixed with their herbs. And if that is you, then I recommend using Japanese bamboo charcoal. It does not contain any additives, is clean burning, and doesn't have a chemical smell to it. The only disadvantage to bamboo charcoal is because it doesn't have the self-lighting saltpeter, you have to keep a steady flame on it to get it lit. You can use a match to light a self-lighting charcoal disc, but to light a bamboo charcoal, I recommend using a lighter or a gas stove flame or some other steady heat source to get it going. Incense sticks, cones, loose incense, and herbal incense all have different levels of you being on board for the mindful present. Some are very involved with multiple conscious steps like lighting the charcoal, waiting for the charcoal to become an ember, and then choosing each herb that you wish to burn for a certain intentional outcome. And others, like lighting an incense cone, are super simple. There's no judging here. It's not like the harder one is the better one, or the easy one is wimping out. This is an incense boot camp. I think if you ask any experienced magical worker, myself included, we kind of use what's needed in the moment, and sometimes we want to put a ton of focus and personalization and work into our spells, And other times, we may not want to be so fussy about the spell work and simply focus on the intention. There is no right or wrong way, and no form of incense is better than another. They are just different tools for different purposes. So listen to your inner voice. If you feel like using a simpler incense, then trust that that is what is correct. If you feel like getting fancy with it, then go for the more complex incense. Trust your gut that you will know what is right for each spell or intention. So let's talk about the ways and whys of using incense. So first, as you can probably guess, you can use incense to imbue a space with a certain energy. When you burn incense in a room or even an outdoor area, you can not only fill that area with some beautifully fragrant scents, you can also fill it with intention. So for example, you may want to burn a love incense in your bedroom or a prosperity incense in your workplace. Say a prayer, spell, or intention for your good outcome and then let the incense spread that intention all over. When you burn the scented smoke and let it permeate the rugs, curtains, furniture, and walls of your space, you are literally infusing the space with your intention. How amazing is that? 
Every time you or anyone else smells the scent or touches something that the smoke has touched, they are coming in direct contact with your intention. You can, of course, also use incense in the way that many of our ancestors used it, not only for bringing in something that is wanted, but clearing out and cleansing a space of unwanted energies. If there was an argument in a room, for example, or illness, or just a general funky stuck energy around a place, you can burn a cleansing incense like camphor, lemon verbena, or rue, and clear out the space, making room for a new start. Another way to use incense spiritually is during prayer or when setting intentions. Having a small ritual where you light incense and speak your prayers or intentions and watch as the smoke carries those words skyward is one of the oldest rituals for connecting with sky deity energies. Another way to work with incense is to smudge yourself using a smudge stick or stick incense. Smudge sticks and incense sticks seem to work better than cones or loose incense for this because they're handheld, but you can most certainly use any form of incense. If you want to give yourself an incense bath, then either have yourself or someone else hold the incense stick or smudge stick a few inches away from your body and moving all around your auric field Use a free hand to wave the smoke toward your body. I like to push it upwards if we're bringing in something good or push it downwards if we're clearing out something negative. By the same token, you can also use incense to bless, cleanse, or feed magical objects, particularly ones that you can't wash or bless with liquids. A great example of doing this is if you have a tarot deck or oracle deck that you want to bless or consecrate or energetically clear. You can light a charcoal and burn a blend of psychic power enhancing herbs, for example, such as anise seed, myrrh, mugwort, and yarrow, and then wave each card one by one or the whole deck through the powerful smoke. Or if you're working with a mojo bag, you can wave it through the incense smoke to feed it or empower it. Ritual knives, gemstones, candles, pendulums, you name it, Any tool that you can use can be empowered, cleansed, or charged in this way. You can also light incense to give some magical juice to your other spell work. I really think this is such an easy and often overlooked way to give oomph to a spell. Imagine burning a come-to-me loose incense while doing a come-to-me candle spell. That extra enhancing vibration going on in the background while you're doing your spell work will give huge energetic support to your intention. Such an easy thing to do that will totally amp up and focus your spells. And don't forget that you can really support your intuition by lighting some psychic vision incense while doing divination. And speaking of divination, another super cool thing that you can do with incense is to use it as a divination tool itself. Capnomancy is the art of divination through reading smoke and incense smoke is perfect for this. You can ask a question, then light an appropriate incense and look to see what symbolic shapes you see in the smoke as it rises. It's such a slow, beautiful, and trancy way to do a reading. Another version of smoke reading is to get a white china plate and move it around over the incense smoke and then after about a minute or so, turning the plate over and seeing the symbolic shapes left in smoke patterns on the plate. Both of these are a lot like tea leaf reading. So if you want to know what certain symbolic shapes mean, you can look up tea leaf reading symbols to guide you. The last way to use incense that I want to share with you is to use incense smoke to enter altered states of reality. The smoke from whole herbs, such as wormwood, mugwort, frankincense, calamus, damiana, myrrh, and many others, can be burned to enter into altered states of consciousness for spiritual work. If you are interested in shamanism and other forms of spiritual work along these lines, then you may consider using incense in this way. As with ingesting any herbs, diligent research before inhaling incense can prevent unhappy events later. 
Well, that about does it for this episode of Magic and the Law of Attraction. If you would like to get even more info about incense, then check out my YouTube video page at hoodohowto.com where you can see several videos showing you how to work with different forms of incense. And if you want to find out some amazing incense tricks and tips, then please subscribe to the Spell a Week newsletter and get a free copy of my gorgeously illustrated ebook, Seven Secrets to Supercharge Your Spell Work. In it, I have a whole chapter dedicated to working with incense and the ways to give more power to your spells and see the strongest and fastest results. Just go to sevensecretsebook.com and get your free copy today. I want to say another huge thank you to John Paul for his super inspiring questions about incense. If you have a question about spells, hoodoo, law of attraction, divination, and any other magical or spiritual topic, you can go to magicandthelawofattraction.com and submit your questions there. Your questions are so awesome. I love reading through them. And if your question gets chosen, for a future episode, you get a gift certificate to my online store, Madame Pamita's Parlor of Wonders, an esoteric emporium, spiritual apothecary, and repository of arcane wisdom. Basically, the Parlor of Wonders is your one-stop online shop for magical supplies, tarot readings, spells, and a ton of free magical instruction. The ingredients for every spell recipe that we mention on magic and the law of attraction are available at parlorofwonders.com. So head over there to check it out. Can I just give a huge loving hug to all you gorgeous law of attraction magicians out there who have subscribed to and shared this podcast with your friends and big, big love to the fabulous folks who have left reviews on iTunes. Thanks to all of you. We are in the charts on iTunes. That is a huge deal and it really helps people find the show the more, the merrier. I think that we should have some sort of forum or group where we can all meet and discuss magic. I'm really debating this. Would you guys like to have a Magic and the Law of Attraction Facebook group where you could meet each other and talk? Let me know in the iTunes comments if you'd like to have a group on Facebook or somewhere else to get together. I'm open to all ideas. Thank you to this week's fabulous listeners who have left some awesome reviews. Thank you to Rune99, who said, Madam Pamita instantly draws you in with her knowledge, insight, enthusiasm, and humor. You are so sweet, Rune99, and I'm glad someone appreciates my corny jokes. A super shout out to Melly Sparkle, who said, subscribe, listen to the wisdom, and fall in love with the catchy theme song. Hey, Melly Sparkle, thank you again. And by the way, in case you didn't know, That's me singing the theme song and you can download it and all my weird old timey music for a pay what you want price by going to my music page, madampamita.com. A jumbo thank you to Ranter13 who said that every second of the show was goal oriented and packed with information. Thank you, Ranter13. And every week we run a contest to pick our favorite written review from that week and give that person a free 30 minute tarot reading with me. And we have a winner. This week's winner is the only Rosie who said that with the episode about working with the Tarot, the guidance about trusting my own intuition was a huge light bulb on for me. I love it when I have one of those moments where the light bulb turns on and that I could bring that to you makes me so very happy. Thank you so much for your sweet, sweet review, the only Rosie. Please send me an email so we can send you your gift certificate for a 30 minute reading. And hey, you person out there who has not put up a review on iTunes, do you want a free 30-minute tarot reading too? You do? Well, then go to iTunes, subscribe to the podcast, and post a written review. Let me know what you like and what you want more of. We'll do it all again next week and give away another prize because I love giving away prizes. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm looking forward to next week when we'll be talking about using magic for personal empowerment, self-love, and belief in self. Who couldn't use more of that, right? Until next time, this is Madame Pamita saying, keep making your life the most magical adventure ever.